Good evening. Welcome. We're, getting, we're in Romans 1, as you, many of you know. Let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, we humbly come before you. We ask that you step on the scene. You push back anything that would disrupt, disturb, and uh, insert itself in this in the wrong way. We just ask that you push everything back, Lord. That you come down in a powerful way, meet each of us in whatever way we need to be met. That you would just encourage our hearts. That you would uh, teach us by your spirit. That you would reveal your word to us. That you would open it up to us in greater ways, Lord. And we just thank you for the opportunity to just partake of your word together. I ask for a very special blessing on everybody here, those who are missing. And Lord, we just trust that you want to do something. We are here to do business with you, and we want you to do something. And we just say this in your name last week. I mean, in your name, Jesus Christ, amen. I'm looking at something last week, yes. Uh, you know, sometimes your eyes go on things, and you think it's like a, a shift in the gears. Well, as you know, last week we talked about the debt. Um, that we all owe our Lord. We all owe a debt. A debt that we can't pay. We couldn't pay unless we wanted to uh, allow our souls to be cast into eternal damnation. That's the debt. That's what would be required of us. It's called spiritual death. That's the consequences of it. And, you know, the reality is I... I stated the last week, we all start out on the great auction block. And we are having different taskmasters bid for us. And we all start out on that auction block because we're all slaves to sin. There's just no way to get out of it. We're born into a disposition of sin. And we're inclined towards sin. We're bent towards sin. We have, a just, uh, we have a tendency to justify sin, so we never face sin. And so all this stuff is going on in these inner men called the souls. We are all uh, fighting this battle with ourselves. And we try to reform ourselves. We try to straighten ourselves up. And how does that work for us? It uh, turns out to be an absolute failure. We are on an auction block, and we are vulnerable, and we can easily be taken captive by harsh taskmasters. And that's the other reality of our situation. Whether it's a, it's a master of fear or addiction or hopelessness or depression or torment, they are all harsh taskmasters. And these taskmasters demands our tyrannical in every way. They are cruel, they're treacherous, and they're out to rob you of everything precious, everything that could give life and meaning to your soul. You know why? Because they are under Satan, and Satan hates you. You cannot get people to understand that Satan hates God's creation. He hates it. He wants to destroy it. He wants to pervert it. He wants to defile it. And the one part of his creation that can reflect his glory is mankind. He really wants to destroy mankind. He doesn't want mankind to reach their potential and reflect the glory of God. And Paul's going to bring this out in Romans. Because of sin, we're all cracked mirrors. Okay, and the image of Christ can't come through those cracked mirrors and unless we are born again. And then the Holy Spirit restores those mirrors so that we can reflect Christ, so that we can come to our potential. But we have started out on this auction block, and the problem with all of these different masters that basically are under Satan is that... They're, that they cause us to pursue things that are insatiable. 
They cause us to uh, go after uh, things that cause us to be restless and, and relentless in our spirits because there's no peace, there's no satisfaction. And they all end in death, spiritual death. But the good news is this. Even though we are on an auction block, we do have a choice as to who, which master we ultimately serve which God we serve. We either serve the God of this world, which is Satan, or we serve the creator of the universe, which, according to Colossians, is Jesus. And so we have a choice. But a lot of people don't want to choose Jesus. They don't want to choose him because they think they may have to give up something. They think they may have to lose something. And so on this auction block, people offer them, hey, you can have Christ. He paid a price for your soul. He's redeemed you. All you have to do is receive that payment, that redemption, and come under his lordship. And you will have salvation. And they still prefer the bondage. They prefer the darkness of it. They prefer that it feeds their fleshly appetites temporarily. They prefer all these things. And that's the good news is that Jesus has provided a way for us to choose the right master and to not come under these other masters. That's the good news. He took care of our sins. He's the one that became sin for us. Now, we all know we can't serve two masters because Jesus made that clear. You can't serve two masters because you're going to hate one and love the other one. And the one we're going to love is the one that serves ourselves the most. That's why we even choose who we love. We choose who we serve. It's an absolute choice. No choice means you're going to go along with the world you're going to go along without these other taskmasters. No choice. It is a choice. It's for the world. It's for whatever you think you can accomplish. It's all out there. We have to decide who we're going to serve. We can't be half-hearted. This is one of the problems with a lot of Christians. They're half-hearted towards Christ. They're not wholehearted. And when you're half-hearted towards Christ... What does he end up with from you? The best garbage, <laughs> leftovers, but he doesn't get the best. And Jesus deserves our whole heart. That's why the Bible says you have to love God with everything in you, with your whole heart, if you're really going to serve him. Because so many people have their foot in the world, they're half-hearted towards Christ because they're still waiting to see if the world's going to give them something. If you're half-hearted, you're going to have a very half-witted half service to God. It's, it's, that's the best way as I, I, I can put it. Now, Paul understood his debt. He understood his debt. He realized that only Christ could solve that problem, that God was not the option, he was the solution, that the world wasn't the solution, it wasn't even the option. We've got to get rid of our options if we're going to serve God. Period. He's got to be our solution. That's the key. We know that according to the world, it allows us to adjust our ways according to what we want, and God doesn't allow us to do that. He calls us to Lying to his way of doing things. And how many really want to do that when we're bent on experiencing our own desires? So Paul knew that he was bought with a price. He knew that servants who love their lords, who really love their lords, because they were honorable and worthy of consecrated service, would sell out to them and they would for become a bond slave to them forever their slave and that's what Paul that's how Paul introduced himself in Romans to us that slave that bond slave that sold out because he understood 
He was bought with the price. Now, if we would do that, if we would understand we've been bought with the price, that we are greatly indebted to our master, we would probably have more appreciation for him. We don't serve the Lord out of duty or honor. We serve him because we love him. Because he first loved us. We serve him because he gave his best. We serve him because he gave his all. We serve him because he's honorable and he's trustworthy. Now Paul mentioned something in Romans 13. I want you to turn there with me. Just go to Romans 13. We'll get to this. Uh, I love this. I go to this a lot. We're going to begin in verse 10. You can go up there. By the way, look at 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. And then he goes down and he talks about the law. What we fulfill. What? That we will not commit adultery. If you really love. Godly love, you won't commit adultery, you won't kill, you won't steal, you won't bear false witness, you won't covet. And all above all this, the reason you can do that is because you love your neighbor as yourself. But look at the next one. He says, love worketh no ill to this neighbor. Therefore, law is the fulfilling of the law. You have to realize that the reason people break the law is because they have ill intent. Because they're unforgiving or they're angry or they're mad, but they don't think it's worth much to put up with their neighbor who's driving them crazy. They really don't have that love, that commitment to do right by their neighbor. You have to know that godly love is a commitment to do right. Regardless, it's honorable in what it does. It doesn't go down to the base way and choose the wrong way. It chooses always the excellent way. And so Paul says, here he says, love worketh no ill. And then he goes on, he says, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. And the day is at hand. The only thing that's going to keep us from throwing our neighbor under the bus is love. Especially as the days get darker. And we become more vexed over what wickedness is doing. As we become more vexed over what people do, we still have to maintain that love, that honorable commitment that if we had a chance to witness to them about Christ and they ever re received Christ, that they, we would welcome them with open arms. But there, we, there's no way you can pay the full debt of love. It's ongoing, and that's the only debt we own. Oh, we don't owe any other debt. And the only way you can pay it back to the Lord is by serving and loving others in the right way and being his hands and his extension. So that love is the one debt we can never pay, but it's the one way to pay a debt of gratitude to our Lord. It's, it's the one way that we pay it in light of true service. And when it comes to worship, because all service True service is a form of worship. But if it doesn't come out of love, it's not going to be accepted. It's a wrong motive. It's all about motivation when it comes to God. Are you loving me? Because, are you serving me because you love me? Are you doing what you're doing because you love me? Because if you are not doing it out of love, you're, it's not going to mean anything not going to mean anything to him, but it's not going to mean anything to you. Love is sacrificial. Love is Christ on the cross. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That is love displayed. Sacrificial, all out there, available to whomever will come and receive it. 
But there isn't love outside of that. There's no love of God outside of unbelief. It, wherever unbelief is, I should say. There's no love. And so it's all about faith. It's all about believing. It's all about receiving that love. You can love somebody, but if they don't receive your love, it's not going to benefit them. And that's what the cross is all about. It says, I have given you, I've offered this love to you. All you have to do is come and receive. I don't want to receive it. Then I can't give it to you. I can't give it to you. And this is a problem I see with a lot of people. God loves me. But have you received it? <laughs> well, have you received it? Because it's not going to benefit you if you don't. And so that's the key of God's love. Now, you have to remember, godly worship does all things in an honorable, selfless way out of good faith. Its kindness reveals grace. And its desire is for good, always for good, which is moral uprightness. And its ways are enduring and pure. You can read that, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, such love for God is the only way we can be responsible to that which we have been entrusted with because we are trustees of the gospel. We are trustees with souls to disciple, to teach, to contend, whatever. We're trustees. That is what we are. That's what we've been entrusted with. Now, we're going to look at one of the scriptures that is used so much. We assume a lot about it. I think, oh, that's nice. We like to quote it. But we really need to understand it. It's verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now this is a powerful scripture. I hear it quoted. How many times have you heard it quoted? For I'm not ashamed. I've heard it many times. But we have a tendency, oh that's nice, but how many of us just so skip over it? We skim over it. And yet there are such major points in this scripture that you don't dare skip over it or you're not going to have that proper foundation. Remember, this is foundation building. Paul's trying to establish us on the right foundation. So when we start reading about these things, we're going to be reading about the gospel all the way through Romans. He's going to be hitting it from all kinds of directions because he wants you to get it. I remember a story one time about a guy that had, was an evangelist. He came to the church and he preached on John 3.16. And everybody thought, oh, that's nice. The second night, he got up, he preached on John 3.16. Every night, he preached on John 3.16. I think it was about four or five days later, somebody says, couldn't you change the subject? He says, when you finally get John 3.16, I can go on. It's just not head knowledge. You know what Paul's doing in the letter of, of, of Romans? When you finally get what the gospel is, I can go on. And when we just sort of brush over these different things, we don't go on very well. Because we don't come from a foundation that we need to come from. So the first thing, why did Paul say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Why did he say that? Because the gospel is the most controversial issue the world has ever confronted. It is the most controversial issue. I am shocked that Christians think, oh, well, you know, I'm a Christian, and it's just a lovely, wonderful situation, isn't it? Go preach the gospel. Preach the true gospel and see how controversial it is. See how it causes reaction. 
how it wakes up dead people and causes them to go into absolute rage. When you really preach the gospel, it's going to do something. When you preach it with power, it's going to wake people up. And it's going to make them mad or glad. But there's no in-between. And so when I see people get up and they give that little, you know, gospel presentation and call people, if you want, come to salvation, come up, and they're still asleep. I think they haven't preached the gospel. They haven't preached it in power. They haven't preached it with conviction. They're, they're not running after souls who are ready to go to hell. They have no passion. Paul knew what understood that when he, wherever he went, he preached the gospel, he was going to get a response. And it wasn't going to be a pleasant response all the time. We Christians want pleasant responses, don't we? Oh, we don't like the controversy. But if you're really presenting the gospel, <laughs> you're going to find yourself in the middle of one controversy after the other. And you're going to barely get out of some of them with your feathers intact. Because that's how controversial it is. And Paul makes a statement up front. I'm not ashamed of it. Well, what does that mean? I'm not ashamed of sharing it. I'm not ashamed of causing the controversy. I'm not embarrassed about it. It's their problem. Not mine. It's about their souls. We have lost the vision of lost souls in hell. And there's no passion in our preaching. There is no urgency in our preaching. And we say, why aren't people getting saved? Duh! What did John the Baptist say? He said, flee from the wrath that is coming. Do we hear that type of message anymore? Well, most of them think, oh, well, I'm saved. Really? Then why are you living like the devil if you're saved? The gospel will change you. And I will prove it to you. It will not leave you the same. If you embrace the truth of the gospel, it will not leave you the same way. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. Boy, one of the things I want you to know in this foundational building is that when you build a foundation, you have truths, you have facts and truths. Well, Paul laid the facts. Hey, the gospel is all out there in prophecy in the Old Testament. And the truth of the gospel is Jesus Christ. Who he is and what he's done. That's the truth of the gospel. Jesus said, I'm the truth. Okay? So, Paul was laying out this foundation of facts and truth. And he's saying, I'm not ashamed because why? It's confirmed. It's true. It's real. I'm not ashamed of it. I am not preaching something that has not been verified and confirmed by heaven itself. The problem is we can prove to be absolute cowards when it comes to the gospel. We can shrink in the corner. We can say, oh, I don't want to insult so-and-so. I don't want to make them feel bad. If they're going to hell, I would rather insult them, make them feel bad before they find out what hell is like. Because there's no other recourse after that. What I've learned through the years is I can't care what people think. I have to care what God thinks. I have to be willing to stand out there, get beaten up, have things thrown at me, and be put down. And I can't care. That's why if you care about what people think and how they look, you're not going to do anything. That's why God told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, don't look at their faces. 
Just do what I tell you to do. We can't care. You know why we can't care? Because we care more about people going to hell and then what we think, what they think. And that puts a whole different, what, angle on it. I care more about you going to hell and then whether you feel good or not. I'm not going to let you feel good about going to hell. That's the problem. Our churches are entertaining people so they can feel good about going to hell. And they think when they stand before God, they're going to get away with it. No, they're not. They're going to be made accountable. And it's going to be dreadful for them. Now what I can tell you, and I'm going to make this statement, Christianity is not for wimps. Don't ever think you're a wimp or you're weak because Christianity is not for wimps. And Paul is basically saying, don't be ashamed. We have a hard time taking on something that is going to be uncomfortable and unpopular. Well, we don't realize, and Jesus spoke it, his truth is going to offend. His truth is going to go right into the middle of man's darkness and expose it. His truth is going to go in and it's going to take away the blinders so they can see. And they're going to hate it and they're going to rage against it. Especially in the days we're living in. It's going to be really bad. But Paul says, hey, I'm not afraid. I'm not a coward. <laughs> I know the importance of the message. Now remember, the truth is a sword. And it will go in, it will divide. And it says even your family. So Jesus said this, Matthew 10, 34, 36. He says, I didn't come and bring peace. I came to bring a sword that's going to cause division even in your families. And then we have Christians, well, why are my families not? <sighs> Anytime you put the truth there, you're going to see that division. And it may cost you your family. It may cost you your family. It may cost relationships in your family. And Jesus is warning about that. I call them fair and weathered disciples. They're found in John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, we know what happened. He, he says some hard truth to his disciples. There were 70 of them. Started out with 70. I don't know how many was there at the time. But there were 70 he started out with, and he began to share hard truths with them. And they got offended. They got offended. I call them fair weather disciples. Because as long as it was going good, smooth, they understood it, that's fine. All of a sudden, here comes the, sh the sword of truth. And it divides, and it separates. And all he was left with was 12 out of 70, and one was going to what? Betray him. One was going to deny him, and one was going to betray him. And that's where he says, are you going to go away too, to Peter? Because what it basically said, and you can look at that, in John 6, 61, it says, does this offend you? He's talking to his fair weather disciples, and in the end, it ended up with them going into unbelief and walking away from Jesus. You see, I have to choose what I'm going to believe. Am I going to believe what Jesus said? Or am I going to get all caught up with being uncomfortable and because I don't understand, I'm going to walk away? And when we do that, we walk away into unbelief to never follow him again. That's all it takes. There are always hard sayings when it comes to the truth. It will cut through all the baloney. And I'm going to tell you something about truth. It's going to embarrass you. You know, Jeanette is a spontaneous person, so I never know what she's going to say. Okay, and just be honest with you. I don't know when she's going to lay one of those statements out, you know. And usually I'm prepared for it, maybe. And when I'm prepared for it, I'm not shocked by it. Truth shocks you. 
And so Jeanette comes out with these statements. <laughs> and I'm like, and all of a sudden I'm like, <gasps> and then I'm like embarrassed because I don't know how it's going to affect anybody. I'm sure no one has this problem, right? And I'm having this emotional conflict, and I'm trying to, okay, God, that's truth, and that's this, and that's that. Now, I don't want to run away, but <laughs> we have that problem. Every one of us does. The difference is we say, okay, why are we embarrassed? Well, we're embarrassed because there's a shock factor to it. And we don't know how it's going to affect that other person. We don't know if they're going to pick up tomatoes and throw at us or anything else. We are now out of control. And when you <laughs> have these statements of truth, you have no control. You don't know how that person is going to respond. And I've had to learn this. You see, I like to move in slowly. Move in slowly. I don't like the shock factors. But you see, the truth, like this, is shock factor. It wakes people up. That's what it's for. It's going to wake you up if you're sitting there. Oh, it's going to wake you up. And then you're going to have these different feelings, and you're going to think, oh, you're so stupid. Why does that embarrass you? Because it's natural. But get over it. If it's truth, it's truth. And you see, people don't want to get over it. Once they're embarrassed, they say, oh, you know, get over it. Christianity's not for wimps. Truth is shocking. It's sharp. It's going to wake you up. It's going to surprise you. It's going to slap you in the face. And it's either going to make you glad or mad. And that's the reality of it. And I've come to appreciate those shock factors in my life. I have. Because I know God's doing it. It's not me. It's God's truth. That's how sharp it is. That's how powerful it is. And I can appreciate it. I can love it for that reason. Because God's intent is to save. His desire is to save. His whole pursuit is to reach the lost. And pull them out of the fires of hell. And since we're all bent on it easily enough, he has to sometimes do some major things to get a hold of us and pull us, jerk us around and bring us back. Now, cowardice can easily come out of any of us when the truth comes, and we need to understand that. We should not beat ourselves up because we're shocked or we have all those emotions going on, it doesn't have to be our reality. What has to be our reality is this is the truth. This is what God is doing. That's my reality. So if they throw tomatoes at me, I just have to go take a shower or find some place to wash it off. But it is not. Truth is a forever thing out here. The response of people are not. They're not. So Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because we can feel a bit unnerved, embarrassed, uncomfortable. And why? Well, why? Think about, why are we embarrassed about the truth? Why are we embarrassed about the gospel? Because after all, it can liberate. It can set free. It can save. I want you to think about this for a minute. What are we fearful of? We're fearful of rejection uh, from people. Failure to hit the mark. Uncertainty. We're, we're afraid of it. And we find ourselves because as soon as fear comes in, as soon as embarrassment comes in, then the shame comes. And we can't let that shame come. We have to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is truth. This is truth. This is gospel. And God's going to use it. And, and Paul's trying to get a hold of these people. Because he wants them to take the gospel out there. He wants them to be prepared for this. How many Christians in the churches are being prepared for the power and the result of the gospel? When you, you spread it. They're not. 
They're not prepared for maybe the rejection or the looks or the anger or anything. They're not prepared for it. And so they go out there and get slaughtered. It's like saying, giving some soldier, somebody you call a soldier, a gun and say, go out and fight the battle and not equipping them. Same way. Our churches, our churches aren't equip, equip, equipping anybody to go out there with the gospel. And that's the problem. Now, I want you to know today, it is important to be led by the Spirit. I'm not saying just go out there and just blow out whatever. You've got to be led by the Spirit. You have to be sensitive. Uh, if you're one of the instruments like Jeanette, you're not thinking about it. If it comes out of your mouth, you trust it's God. But you've got to be available. You've got to be open. You've got to be saying, Lord, bring someone to me, someone to me today to share the gospel with Bring someone to me that I can pray for. However the Lord lays it on your heart. It has to be the preparation. The Holy Spirit has to prepare the person in you. But he uses all kinds of different vessels and different ways of evangelizing. And one way is not wrong because it's my, excuse me, it's not my way. And we have to understand that because God gets a hold of people in all kinds of ways. So here we have the good news that liberates and saves, but we find ourselves wrestling with it. And of course it comes down to a lot of times we lack boldness. It's boldness. And part of it, I believe, is because the church is embracing political correctness. Okay? And we don't want to insult anyone. But what you have to understand about political correctness is the philosophy of socialism and communism. And it's to shut you down. And it's to shut you up about the things of God. That's what it's about. It is an all affront against the gospel. It is an all affront against the call of the church, of Christians. It's a front against us. And if we don't recognize it and start standing, we're going to find out how much of a front it is. We're going to end up either being totally silent or being cut off to the prisons. We need to talk while we can. Okay, that's what I'm saying. We need to speak why we can because it's all communistic. And it's all the plan of Satan to shut us up. How do you think Paul, what he meant? It was all to shut him up. Look at all the attacks that came from Satan. Look at all the instruments Satan used to shut him up. But everywhere he, came, he went, even if it was in prison, in the, among, among the mobs, he shared the gospel. He shared it. They want to control what you say. They want to control your reality. They want to shut down truth. They want to take the power of it. And they want darkness to become people's reality. The problem is, is that people are being taken captive without any opposition from the church, from Christians. Now, it's easy for us to yell fire. Hey, there's a fire. It's easy for us to scream, to awaken someone who is in danger of something. And yet, we can't warn others of the fire of damnation. We can't yell it. We can't scream it. We can't share it. There's something wrong with that, right? We, de we can't declare that many are about to step off the cliff into the abyss of eternity. We were on the Facebook. We have stories on Facebook. And uh, they were talking about Jeffrey Epstein. And they were talking about, well, he, he got away with not facing judgment. And I said, 
but he still has to face eternity in so many words. So as God gets on, he's a conser conservative, but he doesn't believe God. He says, what does eternity have to do with anything? Well, you know, that's an open door for Jeanette. She came in and said, you're not a born again Christian or you wouldn't be asking that question. Because everything is about eternity. Is basically what she told me. I don't think he answered her. Yeah, we're so, supposed to care where people spend their eternity. I care that Epstein went to hell. Was he a wretched, terrible man he, who deserved to pay a price? Yes. But it's not God's heart to see people go to hell. When are we going to understand that? Hell wasn't designed for uh, lost souls. Hell was designed for the demons and the angel, or the fallen angels. Hell is man's choice and preference because he prefers darkness. When you don't choose God, you choose hell. That's, it's, that, it's that simple. Yes, I care. I care for that man's soul, too. And I don't think he's ready to meet a holy, just God. Neither did Jeanette, so she challenged him. What we're being told a lot of times is to be quiet and just make people's destructive journey to hell a joyful, comfortable experience. Not make them un uncomfortable in their sin, not cause a sobriety in them about eternal destination, not say, you need fear of God. You need to understand the fear of God, the dread of God, of meeting him without accepting what he has for you. You have no fear. Man has no fear of God. They have no faith. And they have no God. That's the problem. I love what Paul, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but consider what he says in Ephesians 6, 19, 20. He says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He was asking the people at the church of Ephesus to pray for his boldness. He wanted to be as bold as he could to speak forth the gospel. He wanted people to know and understand the mystery found in the gospel. What is the mystery? Jesus. And that he died for us. That we can be, have eternal life. So here Paul is speaking of the gospel of Christ. Now we know this many gospels being presented today, right? There's nothing new about these gospels. They've always been around, just repackaged. Okay? He's talking about what gospel? If you don't know the gospel, what it is, then your preachers, your teachers, and I have failed you. Everybody in the church should know what the gospel is. And I have not met very many that do. I remember talking to a lady in the cult. She talked about the gospel and the cult. And I said, what's the gospel? She says, it's this burning sensation in my bosom. I'm thinking, you have indigestion. The reality of it is, the gospel is not a burning sense in your inner part. It is a powerful message. It's a message of Jesus. And what he did. And why he did it. So what are some of these Gospels? Well, some of them involve preaching about issues plaguing the country. And it calls for moral reform. There can be no moral reform without the reality of God. You might get reformation, but you won't get transformation. And God is after transformation. He's not after your reformation. That's your doing. Okay? Now, some are preaching fat, uh, 
Pacif I can't even say it. Pacifism. They're just uh, taking pacifiers. <laughs> it's basically inaction, indifference. And what they do is we just need to love, love. They don't want to do anything. You know what? One of the biggest problems Hitler took over because of the chancellor in Britain, one that had the same philosophy. Oh, well, we'll go and try to be diplomatic and just talk, you know, and give him a reason. It doesn't work that way. There's a time to fight. There's a time to uh, be quiet. There's a time. But when you have such wickedness facing you, you are never to be quiet in the face of evil. But they go around and say, love, love, while society is falling apart, caving in on itself, and heading towards absolute chaos. May I say that? Chaos and dis insanity and destruction. Now, the problem with these people is they're really ignoring the real issues. It's man's heart is the real issues. Man's lost. Man's wicked. Man loves darkness. That's what man's problem is. You also have a social gospel. Doing good things, good acts, will change the direction of man. That's what they say. Let's clean up society. But there's no call for man to change inwardly. Because man can't change himself inwardly. Now, all these Gospels are miserable failures. They have been all through the history of mankind. They promote a false reality. Okay? They promote a different truth. They promote another spirit. They promote another Jesus. They certainly are not the true Gospel. And you can see that Paul really had a problem. He says, Already in 2 Corinthians 11, there's people among you presenting. I fear that you're going to get away from the simplicity of the gospel of Christ and you're going to chase after these other spirits, these other Jesuses, and these other gospels. So what is the gospel? What is missing from the gospel today? We know it's Jesus died for our sins. It's very simple. That's the summary of it. He died for our sins. He was buried. And he rose again. That's the summary of the gospel. But how many really understand it? How many really understand it? And of course, that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But what's missing from these gospels, people, is the redemptive work of Christ, the saved man. That's what's missing. The truth of Christ is missing, but his redemption is missing from it too. And so what part of it's missing? The bad news is missing. In order to have good news, you have to have bad news. What's the bad news? Every man is doomed to die in their sins. That's the bad news. And that's what we're watering down today. In this politically correct society, we are stripping the good news of its bad news. So people do not see a need to get saved. Because they're not so bad. I'm decent. Look at how bad the world is out there. I'm not as bad so-so sitting in the pew next to me. Really? The Bible says there's nothing good in you. There's nothing salvageable in you. Without Christ, you are unredeemable. Just let me put that there. It was Christ that came to save man from the death sentence upon his soul. Sin has been taken out of the equation. It has been watered down to make a gospel that's politically correct and acceptable to a world that wants to feel good about itself as it goes to hell. I don't know how else to say it. It doesn't want to be challenged. It doesn't want to be stirred. It wants to feel good about itself.
Now, look at Paul, and I, I love it. Paul considers himself in Timothy a chief of sinners. He says, I'm a chief of sinners. And he says, but God allowed this to happen so I could lay out a pattern. He could lay out a pattern through my life that no matter how bad you are, you could be saved. It's called grace. And so if I'm the chief of sinners and can be saved, guess what? So can you. And my life is a pattern and a proof of that. So how well did Paul understand his sin? He understood it in light of God, first of all. Then he understood it in light of the law. And then he understood it in light of his own darkness. And that's what he's going to show in Romans. He's going to show all three of those things. He knew it in light of God, his holiness, in light of the law, and in light of his own darkness, his own fallen condition. Now, the problem today is we say, God loves you, he died for your sins. But we never go any deeper. We never say to him, you know what? When you see your sin in light of God, you're going to fall on your face and ask for mercy. When you see your sin in light of the holy law, you're going to know you're a transgressor of that law. You're going to know you broke God's law. You broke his covenant. You're going to know it. And when you see your own darkness, all you can say is, I'm lost. I'm miserably lost. There's nothing good in me. But praise God, he sent Jesus Christ. He's going to lay it all out for you. He's just touching base here with you. What is the gospel? What we have to understand is man cannot save man. All these false gospels is about man saving man. What well, is the government saving you? How's that working for you? What well, is religious leaders saving you? How's that working for you? What well, is good deeds going to save you? What well, is being decent going to save you? None of that's going to save you. You can't save yourself. It doesn't matter what church you're affiliated with. It doesn't matter what philosophy you believe. It's not going to save you. There's only one that can save you. His name is Jesus. And he's the son of the living God. He is Lord. He is creator. None of this can save. It's void of any power. And that's an important word because next week we're going to look at that word power. Because G Paul said, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We're going to look at that power. Nothing can save but the power that's found in the gospel. No matter what man does, he's still bent on going down a destructive route. That leads to a great abyss of destruction. All man's attempts may put it put off the, in, in, the, the ultimate results, which is spiritual death and judgment. It may put it off, but they're on the train, and they're on tracks, and they're heading towards that abyss. And you say, what can I do? There's only one thing you can get, do, is get off the train and turn around and face the living God and repent and cry out, for his mercy, his grace, his understanding. Because of all man's attempts will never change the direction of that train. It's only when we step off. We have to get off the train and this is where Christ comes in. He is the only one who can change the direction of where we are going. But we have to get off the train and we have to face him and seek his forgiveness. If we receive him, then we are born again. And at that time, people, please hear me, you're given that ticket to get on that train. And you're heading down the tracks towards glory, eternal glory.
but you've got to be on that train. You've got to have that ticket, which is the Holy Spirit. He's a seal in your life. You can't have him without being born again. Now, we have to understand the gospel according to the real work of redemption. This little sick, fluffy little gospel that's being presented today is really lacking the cost of redemption. And why? If we're going to, if the gospel is going to have any powerful effect on our lives, it's got to become that impactful truth that wakes us up to our condition. And we've got to use it to wake other people up. Now, God's the one that's going to wake them up. And like I said, duck when the he does. Because people are either going to resent you or whatever. But it's okay. They weren't your friends in the first place. But it's all about bringing eternal life to us. Now, as we go through this letter, people, we will constantly be reminded of what the gospel is. And we must not assume we know it because we have heard it or presume we possess it without knowing whether or not it possesses us. Does the gospel possess you? The reality of Christ, what he did. We can't presume unless it possesses us. We must know how the gospel is going to be lived out because it's not taught, expressed in our lives to assure that we're on the right train of redemption. Heading down that track of salvation and heading the right direction towards eternal glory. That's what we got to make sure of. And so I ask people, give me your testimony. Oh, well, I go to church. Sorry, that's not your testimony. Tell me. Have you met Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? How are you doing spiritually? The problem today is there are many that don't care if you're going to heaven or hell. And they're sitting in church pews. And it's a disgrace. I care. And I may not always know what to say, and sometimes I even miss it. And God has to take a board and hit me over the head and say, you missed that. Oh, okay. Okay. But we have a commission. It's to preach the gospel. And Paul's going to lay it out, and he's going to tell you there's power in it. And there's no excuse for not sharing it.